welcoming Susan Turner back to More Than The Song. Susan is bringing with her expertise as both an accomplished singer and choral leader. She has traveled extensively as a soloist, as well as releasing many, many recordings. Susan was the deputy songster leader of the International Staff Songsters in the 1980s and early 1990s, and she rejoined the group in 2009 until 2017, I believe. Susan has also a great um, experience leading local groups, um, at local core songsters and vocal groups, as well as being on the faculty for the UKI's Territorial Music School, and has also visited the Western Music Institute in California. After a career of teaching voice and choral music, the choral singing, Susan and her husband Gerald retired to Bournemouth. However, in the past year, I, I recognise that they've returned back, or they've gone back to Surrey. So thank you for joining me today, Susan. It's really great to have you back here. It's good to see you again, Carl. Yeah, great. It's really great. And um, we'll jump in with the first question that we know singing is an integral part of our worship, our praise and worship. The Bible is full to bursting with passages telling us to sing our praise to God. What importance do you place on sung worship in the church? Yeah, well, music, of course, is a gift from God. And if I had to choose a Bible passage that has influenced me through the years, it would be from Romans 12, which says from verse 6, we have different gifts according to the grace given to each of us. If your gift is prophesying, then prophesy in accordance with your faith. If it's in serving, then serve. If it's in teaching, then teach. And if it's in to encourage, then you should do so. I'd, I'd just like to say that I think Paul could have added, if you can sing, then sing to the best of your ability because um, that, that's how I feel. Um, singing is a form of human expression. And as you say, the Bible actually tells us many, many times uh, to sing God's praises. The fact is that singing in church is an art form that everybody can take part in. You can't all be instrumentalists. Not everybody can play an instrument, a guitar, a piano, anything. Um, and not everybody can dance because um, some churches will use dancing as a form of, of art. I'm hopeless. I, I cannot move to, to sing. Uh, if I'm singing, I've got to stand still. But, but that's, that's not something everybody could do. But everybody has a voice. It doesn't need to be perfect. In fact, it can be totally out of tune. It can be bad but they can take part in singing God's praises in church together. And I think that's the importance of singing in church. Um, and that's what it's all about, an expression of our faith, our love and our gratitude to God. So it's been um, a year, we're coming up to the year mark of not being able to meet in person, not being able to sing together. Um, so we're very conscious, uh, music editorial, um, as a singer myself, that people are going to be jumping back into it. And there might be the, you know, we might see that some people expect to just go straight back to how they left it. Um, it will be over a year. Um, so we'll, we'll start chatting a little bit about kind of vocal health and looking after our voices and possibly how we, we kind of reintegrate into singing and, and group singing again. So when you have led choirs, um, have you come across, uh, this could be for your, your solo um, performances as well, have you come across any particular or recurring vocal health issues? Well, I have to say I've never really had the problem of vocal health issues in my groups, other than the usual people get laryngitis, people have nodules, I've had that, um, and then allergies, and most common, which probably isn't a vocal problem caused by health issues, but that's that wobble where you, where you haven't taken enough breath to control your voice. That, that probably is a health issue because the breathing is wrong. Um, but I have to add something else here, um, and I talked about allergies a few years back. I suffered badly from an allergy to pine trees when we moved to Bournemouth. 
Um, I was surrounded by pine trees where I lived and Bournemouth, of course, as you probably know, is pine tree wonderful. It's just unbelievable. And however beautiful they are, I happen to have an allergy to them, which I didn't know about originally. Um, but there were moments when my voice was non-existent. It was bad. Um, when it cracked and I couldn't even sing any notes, and sometimes I couldn't sing the note that I saw in front of me. And I used to get so upset. I remember coming out of the meeting that the Sompsons had just sung. I had to come out. Um, because I couldn't cope with the fact I couldn't sing. Um, that's me. I mean, a lot of people can't sing all the time, but I had a real problem. But I knew it was a problem with my health issue and caused by allergies. And so, um, thankfully, I um, managed to see a doctor and sort things out. And event eventually it got better. In fact, I remember going away with the ISS and I said to Dorothy, I can't sing a note, but I'll, I'll mime. And so <laughs> I stood there miming my way through a weekend. Um, but yeah, allergies are a nuisance in many ways because you get allergies and hay fever. That, that can affect your voice, um, all that sort of thing. But I got better and thankfully my voice is just back to normal. And uh, it, it's, it's wonderful to be able to sing again. So you talked about your allergy to pine trees and actually kind of raised a really important um, thing with that because you knew something wasn't right, I presume, and, and you knew, you know, it really wasn't working. And um, I don't know if you tried kind of home remedies or anything like that before you went to oh, a yeah. GP, but, um, but you know when something's wrong and you obviously did completely the right thing <laughs> by going to yeah. see a doctor. Um, yes, Dr. Carl. <laughs> <laughs> But no, that, that's really good. It's about trusting your your instincts as well, isn't it? And, and just being yeah. in tune with your voice and knowing when things quite, you know, aren't quite right. Um, going back, think, going back after this year, how are we going to do that? Because uh, for many of us, vocal exercises are important, um, mm -hmm. breathing exercises. Um, uh, to go back and expect to be able to sing as you were before, it's not going to happen. It really won't happen. Um, even if you have a week off not singing and you have to sing on the mm -hmm. following Sunday, it doesn't work the same. So you, you've just got to work at, at gradually preparing your voice to do the work that you want it to do when you go back. Um, and returning to choirs, you know, doing gentle voice exercises, breathing exercises, drinking lots of water, getting some fresh air, We've had none of that. We've had no fresh air and you walk in for an hour or something during lockdown. That's not enough. So um, it's going to be very hard, Carl, I think, for many people. Yeah. But, you know, we'll, we'll do our best. I'm yeah. sure. Yeah, totally. And, and yeah, like I say, it's, it's about attitude as well and how you approach it, isn't it? And, and just knowing that um, even if you feel you don't have the opportunity to prepare before going to, back to that first songster rehearsal, um, you're going with the right attitude that you're not expecting to be able to sing for two hours and, and yeah. you know, maintain that and have a voice by the end of it. Um, yeah, that, that, that's a really important thing. You've, you've touched yeah. upon this next question as well about um, looking after your voice and, and things you do. Um, do you have like a ritual you, uh, prior to singing or, or any, anything like that, which you, which you make sure you do um, to keep your vocal hygiene in check. Um, now, if, are you talking about singing as a soloist or singing in a brigade or in a choir? Because it's slightly different. If I was yes. preparing to sing as a soloist, I would work so, so hard. And this is not fair on any songs that are listening to me now, but I probably wouldn't work quite as hard if it was to go and sing with the group. Um, but as far as singing solo work, I, I have to know what I'm doing. I have to know every note that the piano plays as well, because accompaniments are so important to what you're doing as a soloist. And you've got to know exactly where it's going, what key it's moving into and, and, and all the, the parts there. Um, and so I work really hard at studying that. I work very hard at working at my voice because I'm getting old 
as everybody is, we're all moving on. We're just a year older than we were before this jolly thing. Um, but I am getting old, but I can still sing, Carl. And I think that is just, thanks, thank God that I can still sing. Um, and it's because I work at it, I sing. If I didn't sing at home, then my voice wouldn't be any good. You have to work at singing. If you don't know how to do it, sing songs, just sing five note scales, just do anything you can do to get that voice working. But I would actually work really hard on covering a complete range that I have. And in the morning, I can sing so low, I could almost sing bass in the group. I couldn't probably sing soprano, but come the evening, I can't get down there anymore. I can now sing a lot higher. So I use this sort of change of range during the day to, to work at the voice. I don't sit, I don't sing every second of the day, but I would suddenly go into song, walking around the house, doing the housework, I would sing. I remember when I was younger, when I was hoovering, I used to do all my exercises while I was hoovering. I don't do that anymore. Um, but I do stand at the piano and do exercises there. But the other thing is also with solo singing. I remember years and years ago when I was teaching um, in Sunday school, I was teaching the older children. And one of the boys suddenly said to me, you know, you sing a lot, don't you? I said, yes. <laughs> How do you get up and sing a solo without being nervous? So I said, well, it's simple. I say a prayer every time I have to sing, every time. It's a simple prayer. It's just asking God to use me. And I still do that, Carl, and I really think that God does bless us and gives us the opportunity to do the work that he's asking us to do. So how do I prepare? I do work hard at my voice. As far as going to song practice is concerned, I think the next question that you're going to ask me might help answer that one. Yes, yes, indeed. So it, choral singing or ensemble singing and solo singing, are, are, they are different things. Um, how do you approach them differently? Um, well, you know, what is what is the difference there for you? Yeah, um, you have to blend in. That's the thing. A soloist has to blend in with an ensemble. Having said that, it, for me to blend in with a group, it's very hard. I find it hard because um, your voices are different in texture. They're different in color. They're different in strength. But you can't have a choir made up of soloists. So somehow we've all got to think that we've got to blend together. Um, to, to try and get the dark velvety voice blending with some light sopranos on a, on a unison line is quite difficult. Um, especially also if some of those light voices are the age of like 18 or 19 and some of the dark velvety ones like me are in their 70s. How do you blend that together? Uh, the leader has a real problem, but you've got to try as an individual to blend in. And it's not easy, very, very difficult. And so we try our best. And I can't think of any other way than just by using your ear and using the ability to, to change if you have to, 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 to melt in and blend with the others. Otherwise you'll be sticking out like a sore thumb, won't you? Mm. That's, it's hard. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. It's, yeah, I, I agree. It's, yeah. It, and um, you have to take so many different considerations into account. And obviously, with when you're, when you're a soloist, you, you can move around more. You can, you know, as in musically, you can pull it around a bit and, and really lean, yeah. lean into moments. Um, but sort of the choral singing, ensemble singing, you're, you're part of a team, aren't you? And you're working together on, on something. And yeah, it's, it's about, um, yeah, just working with others and not um, not for yeah. yourself, definitely. True, true. Um, do you have a favourite singer or choral ensemble? Um, what is it about them that you that you like? Um, I have to admit, I don't listen to many recordings. I'm not into listening. I've got hundreds of CDs in there, but very rarely do I listen to them. So when you said that, I thought, oh, am I supposed to say something like Janet Baker or, you know, Catherine, all these, you know, I, no, I, I love Janet Baker's voice, but 
you've got to be very careful as a singer that if you've got somebody like that to listen to, you start to think, right, am I going to sing like that? And you shouldn't really try and copy anybody. You should be individual. Um, but the one I really love to relax with is Barbara Streisand. I just love the way she sings. She's able to sing jazz, to sing pop. She can sing musicals, but she sings classics too. And I don't know whether you've ever heard her sing Lashia Kiyopianga. It's, it's just inspiring. You really must get that recording. She does a, she's got a recording of class, classical music, purely classical. Um, she's not trained as a classical singer, but uh, it's just lovely to listen to a relaxed classical sound. And I love, I love, love to hear that. Um, and if I'm allowed to like a man, <laughs> <laughs> Am I allowed to, to like a male singer? Of course. I'm afraid it would be Michael Bublé. <laughs> <laughs> I just love his voice too. It's it's that sort of relaxing, lovely, clear, mm -hmm. beautiful sound that I love to hear. And yeah. he, he did train as a youngster. He did have lessons as a youngster. Whereas I don't think Barbara did, but... Um, I don't suppose they're the two sort of people you'd expect me to say, really, was it? No, actually, no, not the, yeah. <laughs> I'm impressed. I'm, I'm a big fan of Barbara Streisand as well. And, oh, yeah, are I'm, you? Uh, oh, lovely. Yeah, we do group, like the, to. The, yeah, the group, um, if I listen to a group, um, I do like unaccompanied singing with smaller groups. Now, I don't know how to say that, Boche 8. Is that how you say it? V O C E? Yeah, yeah, Boche 8, yeah. <laughs> it's that one. That, I like to hear them. I like to hear Il Diva. Um, but for a group that um, inspired me years ago when the ISS went to America, we went to Florida for a day and we went into the American, um, what was the Liberty Singers we heard. Do you, have you heard the Liberty Singers? And it was Christmas and they were singing Christmas carols all dressed up and we just sat on the floor and just, this is the ISS, just were inspired and in awe of these Liberty singers. And then they found out who we were and they asked us to stand up and sing to them. And so that, that was an exciting time. But ever since then, I've had Liberty singers recordings. And if you're here at Christmas, it will be on all the time. I just love their Christmas albums. But yeah, yeah. love that. Yeah, no, that's, that's fab. Um, now, I know when you came on last, um, you'd shared some musical highlights. Um, I don't know if you want to share any uh, now, any, anything else that might have come to mind since then or anything you I want to reiterate. I, said, I can't remember <laughs> what I said last time, but it's probably the same. <laughs> it is hard to talk about highlights in my, in, in my life because it covers so many years, Carl. Um, you know, my early days when I was singing with my two sisters um, as the Stevens sisters, that was a highlight at the time. Then my late teens, I became an, one of the national songsters. You probably don't even know who they are. Um, then as a socks leader in the, when I was 20, and then I became socks leader at Staines and at Stowe Market. So many highlights throughout my life. And of course, being in the ISS with Norman and, and then again with Dorothy. So how do I choose a highlight from that vast experience? So I will think more of a special moment, and I don't know whether I did say this before, but you know, it's not the big glamorous festivals and it's not the big halls that I've sung in. Um, I'm just thankful that God's used my voice to bring some sort of comfort and cheer and blessing. But one occasion was when I went to Cape Town and um, I was the soloist in South Africa for a little trip there. And we went to a township called Crossroads. And um, we went to this township in a Salvation Army, uh, what did they call it? Uh, it was a van really, but um, a pulpit that came down at the back. And I had to stand there and sing to these poor folk. And that, that was something God gave me the grace to do. And I loved it and it was just working. It was super. My recordings have given many people the opportunity to hear some wonderful songs um, that God has given us. And one particular song that comes to my mind um, is Share My Yoke. Now, Joy Webb gave me this song many, many years ago. I didn't realize it would be used so much 
and it's still being used. I've had many, many letters and cards and phone calls from people who've been moved by that song. And I thank God for the, the joy and, and, and thank joy for the opportunity that I've had to use it. I had a letter quite a while ago now um, from a lady in Canada who said that her husband was seriously ill. And she said that uh, he was listening to my recording and particularly to share my yoke every day. Now, a couple of years later, we had a holiday going to Alaska and stayed in Vancouver. I got in touch with this lady and said, I'd love to come and see you. And so Gerald and I went to see them. Um, he was very sick. And we stood in that lounge holding hands, the four of us, and I sang Share My Yoke to him. That was a special moment. That was a highlight of my experience as a soloist, as, as my, my work for God. That's what I did. And I just thank God that he's given me this opportunity. And that, to me, was the highlight. <laughs> Thank you for that. I um, appreciate you sharing that story. That's quite moving and imagine an incredibly, you know, an experience that will stay with you. Very, very moving. Yeah. Thank you. As part of our chat today, uh, we're going to be looking at this beautiful piece of music, Compelled by Love, by Stephen Pearson and Andrew Blythe. And if you want to follow along at home, um, this song is found in the Sing to the Lord Journal, Volume 10, Part 1, and is also available for purchase on essaymusicindex.com. So, Susan, um, over to you. Uh, let you guide us through this. Yeah, um, you asked me to choose a song, uh, and I have to say I've chosen a song for reasons that if I'm looking for something for a group to do, I have to look, first of all, is there a good melodic line? Because I do think that melodic line is important. Do that, does it have great words? And is it a good composition altogether? Now, the melodic line here is, is just, for me, superb, um, because it, it works so well with the words. Um, compelled, first the first words, compelled by love. Now, you wouldn't say that on a monotone, would you? Compelled by love, <laughs> compelled by love, you know, you would, and it immediately does it. A uh, lovely jump of the fifth straight up to the B flat, lovely. So I, that's the sort of thing I would look for um, and good words. Uh, and certainly I also think Andrew Blythe writes beautiful music. So that's another reason why I would have chosen it. So good melodic line, great words, good composition. There are challenges in it, however. So do we want to talk about the challenges? Yes, definitely. It, it, it is a very challenging piece, I think, from experience. <laughs> yeah. um, yeah, the, another thing is that I wanted to say that as a leader, you, you are governed slightly by tempo. But I do think some people rush things through. Music needs time. And, and if there's a gap, have a gap. You know, don't rush on. Take your time with it, because I, I think it makes the world a difference. Um, the challenges I find in this one are, are breath control. Um, that would be the challenge probably in every song that you sing. The challenge also is in on the on this second page, um, bar 13, you've got um, triplets coming in at bar 13 and at bar 15, more triplets. People find it very hard to sing a triplet um, in time with the music. And so I have little tricks with that whether you want to know what that trick is or whether we talk about that later. Um, but uh, so, so that's a little bit of a challenge. The other challenge I find when, when hearing singing is the syllabic problems that people have, where every single syllable is emphasised. That, that doesn't work. It's not part of singing. We need to change that idea of every syllable being, it happens in music any time. And then the other thing, the challenge is the importance of vowels. Vowels are gonna create your tone. And so they're the challenges that I've got. 
And then after that, I got some tips on how to cope with those challenges. But yeah, it's just good just to identify some key moments, I think, um, such as, um, yeah, this this first phrase at bar yeah. five, um, just, uh, I guess, with the breathing, as you said, because the, the phrases are, are quite long, aren't they? And I found that um, if you need to try and snatch a breath, you're you're at risk of compromising the melody yeah. line, aren't you? And, yeah. and You've got to take Compelled by Love straight over. So... You've got compelled by love, called to serve. And I think on that lovely longer note, the, the dotty minimum needs to just grow slightly to take you over to the chord. And compelled by love, called to serve. And you should be able to do that in one breath. If you have to snatch your breath elsewhere, fine, because you're in a group. But I do think as a leader, I well, I always would just take that straight through. Um, same with them. Um, same with yeah. the men who are going to do it later on further down bar nine mm -hmm. so yeah but of course sorry of course you've got this this nice um kind of quaver movement in the piano as well just to carry the, the singers along um as well and hopefully maybe if the singers are in tune with that and, and listening out for that that helps yeah them, we'll take it through um, push push it and, and the other thing about the pianist of Definitely. course that it could be very syllabic problem there yeah yeah. But, 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 so you've got to be careful that that doesn't happen with your pianist. Okay. How do you tell your pianist not to do that? Woo. Okay. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's a tricky yes. one, isn't it? Um, but it's, I guess it's all about the line and, and following the, uh, and maybe that's where the relationship between singers and accompanists are, are really important, that they're really listening. Um, sometimes there can be nothing more tricky than a, a runaway pianist who gets their head down and bad, you know, bad, see them bad, at the end. Yeah. Um, and then, yeah, on bar, bar nine, um, this is a moment that I've always found very tricky as a bass baritone, <laughs> jumping up to this E flat so early on in the piece as well. Um, how would you um, approach that or encourage your men in this first verse to approach that, that jump? Because you're in unison at that point, aren't you? Yeah. Yes, in the first verse. Um, well, the G before it. Now, compelled by... The, I would just make them... There's already a crescendo above there, isn't there? So I would put a crescendo on by. By love. And it helps to lift the voice up. We've got to have enough breath to do that, though. Um, and so, yeah, I always think if you're going to go for a high note, you've just got to put the pressure on before it and then land on it. Yeah. Correct. Like a, a springboard, yeah, yep. yeah, lovely. Yes, and then and then we come on to bar thirteen. Yes, sir. These, yeah. these triplets. Yeah. How would you how change would you, the uh, words immediately? To pineapple. <laughs> I, rem I remember that. Pineapple Grace, you remember? I do. When you led a ISS rehearsal, you had us singing pineapple. <laughs> I, I did a rehearsal with. Um, the safe music school that I did once and I told them about pineapples the next morning I go into my into the hall and sitting on my music stand is a pineapple <laughs> but they took it in they could do the triplet and it it works with pineapple it works with strawberry you know it doesn't matter 
But um, it does honestly get that. I don't know why, but <laughs> touched by God's grace. Normally you get touched by God's grace, which would be totally yeah. wrong. But pineapple grace, lovely. It works. Get the group to sing Fantastic. the word. And, and they yeah. smile and they're enjoying it and they get it right. That's a, just a silly little tip, basically. That's one of my tips. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, but it, it, if it works, it it works. Some of the most quirky. Sure you it works. <laughs> you know, yeah, it's, that's, <laughs> no, that's, that's really good. Um, um, yeah. So, so we so, move along a bit. Yeah. And can we go to bar uh, 17 and 18? So of course. When I am born again by his forgiving. He, this is where I was worried about this syllabic sort of thought. When I am born again, because you've got all those equal quavers. Um, you need to work out where you're going to put that emphasis. And you need it on the word born. When I am born again by his forgiving. Now you need to lean on give and take it across. So you've got that, when I am born again by his forgiving. And it just makes it work. But if you make it all syllabic, all forte, every note, but, 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 terrible. So things like that have to be thought about by the leader. Yeah. And also at this moment, um, kind of the, the altos are, are, I guess, however you want to split the voice parts, um, but the altos are split into two and there's a lot of clashing going on. Um, another is going back to what you were saying about ensuring you're doing your best to blend. And, and you know, if you've got a lovely note to sing, it doesn't mean that you need to sing it out. What a shame. Yeah. <laughs> I tell you what, the altos never have lovely notes to sing. <laughs> Uh, but the middle, yeah. yeah. Second soprano or, or first alto would have a nice little time there. Mm -hmm. Definitely, definitely. Um, I don't know whether you teach, when you're teaching your groups that you do, whether you work on vowels, because uh, I've always worked on vowels. And the R sound is important because it comes up so often. But the word love is love with an R. It's not love. And I've heard so many people say, sing love. Mm. <laughs> now we're talking about the classical side of singing, you know, okay, I'm not talking about pop music and I'm not talking about modern music. I'm talking about the way we sing as a choir. Um, and I think you make sure your group is singing the word love properly because it comes in such a lot on this piece of music. So I would work hard at that R sound, compelled by love and then just take it over. So that's the vowel I was going to work on. Um, and really, we, I just work on five uh, vowels and not the English five vowels, but as you know, we've got the Italian sounds. And teach them those Italian sounds and get them to sing part of the song with just sound of the vowel with no consonants. Now that's quite hard to do because they look at a, people look at a vowel and sing it as we know it, not as the sound of it. Um, but again, it brings a smile to their face when they're trying really hard to, to sing um, R-L-I-R, you know, and all that sort of thing. And, and you've got your group, you're there, you know, on their yeah. feet. Um, and, and work on your vowels because that creates the beautiful tone that you want. Sorry, I've jumped in. Certainly. In no, I think, I think you've hit the kind of the, the gold mine there with with blend uh, it's it's in the vowels and ensuring that and by taking out the consonants during a rehearsal obviously not you'd never sing it out of course not like no, that um, yeah. but it's, it's easy to identify those moments where um vowels aren't you know aren't blended or people aren't singing the, the same um when i was younger in a choir i remember our conductor um 
make uh, making us get up uh, two fingers and place yeah yeah yeah, yeah. There, yeah. and we'd, we'd sing through a whole piece oh, with our yes. with our fingers I've and, done our, that. Like, and our teeth <laughs> i've done that yeah. definitely <laughs> with with groups yeah get them together yeah and it just helps open up the the the, the space yeah. in your mouth but also with the vowels and the, we might not do it actually, at the moment but it's not actually too big is it you don't look stupid when you're, yeah. it, people think yeah. it, but because your brain exaggerates anything that your mouth does you know that um you've got to, if you get like a cavity in your tooth it feels like you know an enormous mm. volcano and it's actually just a tiny little cavity and you it, it exaggerates so people can't open their mouths wide enough because they think it's huge but it isn't so just two fingers is fine ah Ah, oh, nothing. We can move on to the to the key change moment. The key change, I love. On everything. Oh, what it makes the song, doesn't it? I know we we all get you sing these modern songs, and there's always a key change at the end. You say, "Oh, not another key change," but this one works. You know, it really. Yes. And the fact that we're in unison, we're all there. We're all compelled by love. Unbelievable! What a song, hey? Mm. Called to follow Christ, no matter where He leads. You couldn't get anything better than that, can you? In unison with that lovely change of key, then you've got to make sure that your sopranos can get that lovely top G on the next phrase. Mm -hmm. And by doing it, if you grow through the word by, compelled by love, you'd, you'd get up there. Just push that voice up and jump to it. Like yes, definitely. And I, I think... So just to go back to kind of the whole the key change and, and, and the, the lyrics that, you know, that you've read. Um, it's a great example of when I think lyricist and composer work very well together. Um, I've done a couple of years ago, I did a little bit of a, a song with Stephen Pearson um, and it really opened my eyes to how involved he is as a lyricist in the composition process. And right. it was three or four times I, I, I placed a key change in a song for you know some words he wrote and three or four times he kept coming back to me saying no it's not right you know you need to redo that key change right. interesting um, yeah yeah so I, I thought yeah that came to me when I was looking at this and you can see that they've worked together there to really establish that that positive uh, positivity throughout this third verse um, it's really absolutely. it's really special yeah it is absolutely and then you get to nearly get to the end where you've got this open vowel again of the word love. And it's got to be the right vowel to get that one. Yes, most definitely. Um, again, yeah, that blend and that and, and that kind of I guess the tuning will come with the blend as well. And they, they work together, don't they? Um, well, we hope so. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's, uh, it's yeah the, it is a superb ending. It's, it's Song. It's an amazing conclusion to, to what I believe is a God-given set of words and a God-given set mm -hmm. of music. It's a great song, great words, great music. Yeah, most definitely. Most great definitely. God, yeah. Mm -hmm. 